this broadcast to bring you this important bulletin from the United Press. Flash, Washington. The White House announces Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Stay tuned to W. I was walking down the main street in Sturgeon Bay here, and uh, there was a big sign in the Door County News window, Pearl Harbor has been bombed. I was working at the time in the shipyard, and it was Latham Smith Shipbuilding. And uh, in those days, or at that time, we were building four little small tugs for the Army engineers. What began as a small shipbuilding contract was soon to grow into a significant portion of what would become the world's largest ever construction program. By the time we were done, Sturgeon Bay's four shipyards would build and launch 258 ships of every shape and size that could squeeze through the locks of the St. Lawrence and Mississippi rivers. Cargo ships, supply ships, warships. We knew we could do the job. We had the resources in this country to uh, make the ships. We knew we had steel available, and we knew we had copper available for the wiring that was required. So we, we could do it. We knew we could do the job. And jobs needed to be filled. Statewide advertising campaigns to an income-starved public brought immediate results. I graduated from Algoma High School in May of 1943, and they said that they were hiring at the shipyard, so I, I drove up to Sturgeon Bay and went to the, their office, I forget wherever the main gate was, and said that I would like to apply for a job, and so they had me fill out an application, and then, I don't know, someone interviewed me, and they said, can you start tomorrow night? <laughs> In less than five years, total employees at Sturgeon Bay shipyards would explode from merely a handful to over 7,000. We had a stream of cars coming up from Green Bay that you wouldn't believe because, of course, work was scarce in Green Bay and we had to work up here. So these people would carpool and uh, come up here uh, in uh, four or five people in a car. I was impressed by the number of, of women welders. A lot of very good ladies were welding on all of the ships and working at, at other jobs too. I saw the ad in the paper where they needed welders and so then when I was in high school I uh, went and took welding nights. You'd have a big long hoses and you started out at one end and you had to sometimes you had to go way to the end of the ship and then you had to find your hookup for your where your welding with the machine was they were welding machines all over and you had to do that. You had to haul your, you had your helmet and you had a box of rods, welding rods, your whip, you know, and then the, the big thing, big hose and it was hard. We'd have to pull them from the, below the ship up to the top and then sometimes you had to go down some steps with them and there was, you had to get extensions even. To accommodate the thousands of new workers streaming into town, Sturgeon Bay dug in and transformed itself from an isolated, sleepy hamlet to a fast-growing, fast-paced boomtown. Two government housing projects were fought for and won by local civic leaders. The Sunset Project, now a quiet neighborhood of small, well-built homes on Sturgeon Bay's north side, was quickly constructed to serve about 600 families. Across town, the Sunrise Apartments became the home to 500 more workers. We saw the uh, springing up of a trailer camp just uh, around where Little Lake is now, where people just moved their trailers in, the sanitation wasn't very good, there were complaints to the city council about the sanitation. With pre-war infrastructure sagging under the weight of an almost doubled population, the town responded. In 1942, a bus line was formed, Sturgeon Bay Transit, to give gas and tire ration citizens a nickel ride to anywhere on its route. 
just 50 miles to the south in Green Bay. Another bus line would shuttle workers each day directly to the shipyards. In tribute to the workers from all around Northeast Wisconsin, during the war, over 25 million passenger miles would be logged between the two cities. We had a sleeping giant here in Sturgeon Bay with all the shipbuilding facilities that we had here. So uh, I think we had a lot to do with, uh, we were very important in winning World War II. The uh, Navy awarded a contract to Latham Shipbuilding for, to build a subchaser, a PC they called them. And it was the 496 was the first one to build. And uh, they uh, were awarded other contracts afterwards for many more of those same ships, along with other ones that were built for cargo ships. And uh, one other model was a Corvette and water tenders and what have you. Well, it was in May, and it was uh, a beautiful day, and I had a new suit, and I had a corsage from the ensign that uh, was there for his ship. Launching celebrations in Sturgeon Bay were occasions of community togetherness. The town came out, and the band played. The workers watched with pride. At the launching, mine especially, I was looking down at the men and they, pay, they play the Star Spangled Banner as it goes into the bay. And you look down at the faces of those men that built that ship and the love and the adoration and the pride in their, their faces were just amazing. For a small town to be launching a large ship, on average once every five days, you'd expect to find corners cut and sometimes less than first quality construction. But in Sturgeon Bay, that was not the case. It was good, it was clean. The workmanship was seemed to me was good. To my idea of what a boat should be. They knew it was a war, and they had to do a good job. They didn't want to put a, do a half a job and have something happen on the boat or something like that. We were proud of what they built. And all the people in the yard were proud of what they built. We, run, we uh, earned the Navy E for effort, excellence. Not lost on wartime workers was the desperate need for the ships that Sturgeon Bay was producing. All four shipyards were constructing key Army, Navy, and Maritime vessels. Peterson Boat Works 37 motor launches, aircraft rescue vessels, and 110-foot submarine chasers. Sturgeon Bay Boat Works, now Palmer Johnson, 43 freight and aircraft rescue boats for the U.S. Army, and Sturgeon Bay Shipbuilding and Dry Dock's 85 tugs, tenders, cargo, supply and retrieving vessels. But the largest single contribution came from L.D. Smith Shipbuilding's 93 frigates, net tenders, tankers, cargo ships, gunboats, and especially 173-foot sub-chasers, or PCs. Built for convoy duty and patrolling shallow bays in the Atlantic and Pacific, 38 of these depth-charge-laden sub-killers left Sturgeon Bay waters to hunt for the silent, terrorizing Japanese sub-fleet and German wolf pack. 450 ships were sunk along the east coast of this country by German submarines. That's a lot of, a lot of tonnage to lose in a short period of time. The people going to Florida in 1941-42 could see the submarines sinking the freighters right off the coast of Florida while they were out on the beaches. You know, we didn't, we needed something to, to combat those submarines. They started out with the, um, with the PCs, with our sub chasers. They were about 173 feet by 24 feet. They carried about 73 men. I went aboard the PC in July of 19, 
1844 at Tulagi, which is in the Solomon Islands. We would escort ships from Tulagi over to New Guinea and around the islands up there. Launched on the 4th of July in 1942, the PC-590 saw extensive action in the South Pacific. It did convoy duty and escort duty, anti-submarine patrol, which was probably one of our main jobs. Uh, we would patrol around the islands and up the channels uh, uh, looking for Japanese subs that would come in and uh, work these small harbors and wait for the ships to bring uh, convoys to come in. We would run around the convoy trying to pick up the submarine contact, which would be a, a ping. And if we did, then of course, then we drop depth charges on it. I never heard anybody say anything negative about the PCs or the ships that were manufactured in Sturgeon Bay. They were all very well thought of. They were extremely important to our war effort. I don't think we would have survived without them. And on August 15, 1945, it was all over. I'm now broadcasting to you from the White House ground. Now, you heard the flag, I am sure. The Japanese offer of unconditional surrender is official. It has been accepted. Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin, a small town in an out-of-the-way corner of America. But towns are best judged not by size, but by heart, by the contribution of good to the world. And by that measure, by any measure, this town, this very special town, did its job very, very well. It certainly was amazing that this community did what they did, and I don't think that uh, if anybody would have predicted it, they would have ever thought they could, could have done it, you know. I'd done the best I ever could, and that's the way I try to teach my men to. Do the best you can. And uh, it, uh, it paid off. I was proud of myself because I did a good job and I like to do a good job. Yes, I think if I was able, I'd do it again. I really would. We did a beautiful job. They wouldn't even let a little hairline leak of air go by. They'd come in and redo it so that they, when they went out of here, they were perfect. They were, you know, they're beautifully built ships and they operated for, you know, for years and years with no problems. They, I think Sturgeon Bay was tremendously important to the war effort. I don't think the people outside of Sturgeon Bay realized that, except the, the people who sailed on those subchasers, if they ever, if they knew where they had been built. They did everything that was expected of them, plus things that were never expected of them. They performed very, very well, and I have nothing but respect for them. I think they did a job well done.